Revelation chapter 2. New, uh, a new church to deal with. New verse to look at. This will hold us, this will hold us good for the next six to eight months. Something like that. Um, I don't, I don't remember if I showed you this last week, week before last, but somebody sent it to me. They counted all the names of Jesus in the book of Revelation. Like in uh, chapter 2, verse 1, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. That's one name. And then if you look in uh, our, our verse today, verse 18, um, Under the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. So that's another name for Jesus. And they listed all the names of Jesus... And when I, when you guys know me, whenever I see a list, I count it. And lo and behold, 33 names of Jesus in the book of Revelation. And you just go, that's not an accident. That can't be an accident. That's on purpose. God speaks in order. He puts, has an order to everything that he does. And I just, I love it. So, Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. Does, the son of, does his title, Son of God, his name, Son of God, does that make him God? Yes. I am a Son of Man. That means I'm a man. Okay? The Son of God means he's God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. Brass is a symbol of fire in the Bible. In fact, um, what was it that led Israel by night? Pillar of fire. When Moses made, when the, when the fiery serpents came and bit all the people, God told Moses to make a fiery serpent on a pole and he made it out of brass. Brass is a symbol of fire. And if you look in like Revelation 10, which uh, my thing with Revelation 10 is, I believe that it's Jesus. I think it has to be. I've been wrong before. But when you look at the description, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun. That's Jesus. Mm -hmm. And his feet is pillars of fire. And here, in that verse, his feet are like fine brass. Well, brass is a picture of fire in the Bible. So I think there's a connection there. I won't get into all that, but anyway, that's what I think. Notice verse 19. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works. Now, I don't know why he mentions their works twice. But he does. And something to consider, and this is not really part of the lesson, but something to consider. There's two types of servants. And it doesn't matter if it's church, business, family, doesn't matter. Two types of people that, that work. Those who work to be seen, to be prized, to be rewarded, to be praised, and those who work because the work needs to be done. And you can keep the prizes, you can keep the awards, you can keep all that stuff. If somebody works for a company, like say somebody works for McDonald's. Now I'm not speaking out against McDonald's, but I'm not a McDonald's guy. I worked there two days, two weekends, when I was in Nashville in Bible college, and that was not my thing in life to do. Praise God. But some people work there, they get a job there when they're teenagers, and they stay and they end up becoming franchise owners. And it's because they love the work, they love the company, they're dedicated to it, they're loyal to it, and that's just them. They don't want, they don't want some big title. They don't, they're not looking for that. It's just that's what they like to do in the church. Again, two types of people that work. 
those who do things to be noticed. You know, some of these charitable organizations in town, they love to have this big check printed up where they're giving it to somebody, some organization, and there's a guy taking their picture to be put in the paper. Jesus says they've got their reward. They got their name and their picture in the paper. hoop de doo Okay? When you work for the Lord, don't labor for the things that are temporal, which can be lost, even money. Money, and I think it's funny that on our money, a dollar bill, there's an eagle on it with wings, and the Bible says that don't, you know, trust not in uncertain riches, for it groweth wings like an eagle and flies away. And that's exactly how it is. If you work to be credited, if you work for, if your goal is to make as much money as you can, it, that's your reward, and you're going to get it. And then when you die, you're going to lose every bit of it. Jesus told us to labor not for the things of this world, but labor for the things in heaven where moth and rust won't corrupt it. it it'll still be there. And if nobody else knows that you did something, Jesus taught us about prayer. And he said, when you pray, don't go out in the street pray and showing everybody how big you can pray. Get in your closet and pray. And let me tell you something. I've done, I've literally done that. Literally got in the closet, shut the door to pray. And I'm telling you, God honors that. When you don't make a big deal about it. When you don't, when you fast and don't tell everybody, I'm fasting today. I'm being spiritual. I fast twice a week. Every Don't tell anybody. Because then you're doing it to be noticed. You're doing it. So people can think you're really spiritual. And that's what some people do. Then there's always people who give and they don't want the attention. They don't want the praise. Some people, we have to, just so some people understand this. This is an Obama law. When Obama was president, he made it so that the IRS changed its rules. And if you gave any, if you gave an amount over $250 to a charitable organization... A form has to be filled out and sent in to them and to the IRS. And we have people that kind of get on to us saying, I don't want your form. Well, we have to send it. We'll get in trouble if we don't. It's by law, if you give any more than $250, we have to fill out a form and we have to send it to you. And it ties up. You just ask Rose about it. It ties her up and at least one of the girls I know helps her work on that. And we got to send those out for every single donation above $250. It's ridiculous. And some people say, I don't want that. Well, we can't, we can't not send it to you. And some people say, well, I don't give to have that taken off my taxes. That's fine. I understand that. My thinking is, if the government doesn't supposed to get the money, I'm not donating it to them. That's my thinking. So I'm writing it off, okay? Anyway, uh, but some people give and don't want their name associated with it. They don't want, they don't want their, their reward here. They want it when they get to heaven. And Jesus is saying, I watch your works. I know what you did, both good and bad. I know thy works. I know your charity. I know your service and I know your faith and I know your patience and your works and the last to be more than the first. I know what kind of church you are. I'm the one who knows what's going on in your church. Now the praise is over with. Now he's got something serious to deal with. Good churches can always have something bad going on in it. Think about that. Good churches can always have something bad going on in it. Um, I, if I remember right, there was one church out of these seven where Jesus didn't really condemn them in much. And I think 
as far as the Apostle Paul and the letters that he wrote, I think the church at Philippi was probably the most commended, the most praised. If you were to, if you were to list the churches as far as favorability, I think the Philippian church would be number one, and I think the Corinthian church had the most problems in it of any of the churches that he, that he started. So Jesus is saying, okay, here's the good news. Now here's the bad news. Verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. And these are serious, very serious things. Because thou sufferest, which means you allow that woman Jezebel. That's the title. Help me to remember that. That's going to be the title of the Sunday school message on Sermon audio tomorrow. That woman Jezebel. Now, we don't know if there really was a woman in this church whose mother gave her the name Jezebel. I don't know of any girl or any woman whose mother named her Jezebel. I know some whose mother should have named them Jezebel. Okay? <laughs> But I don't know of any. I, and whether this person really was called Jezebel or not, I don't know. But I think Jesus is naming this woman Jezebel. He's not giving her a real name. But when he writes the letter to the church at Thyatira and the church at Thyatira reads it, I guarantee you everybody knew who Jesus was talking about. Guarantee you. That woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, what, what is, help me out here. What are some of the problems that we already see in this, in this part of the text here? What's, what, what can we gain without looking at any other place in the Bible what can we gain from why he has a problem with this woman, Jezebel? Okay. First thing out of his mouth was, which calleth herself a prophetess. She was self-appointed. Self-appointed. She said, God called me to be a prophet. Now... Um, hold your place there. And I don't have this in my notes. But turn to, um, turn to second. First Timothy, I think. First Timothy. I used to have this verse. I used to have this passage. I preached on it, one, I think my third sermon in the world preaching was when Paul told Timothy, neglect not the gift that is in thee. Here it is in, in uh, 1 Timothy 4, 14. We'll back up and look at verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. In other words, Timothy was going to be a bishop of this church. Paul had started the church and he had trained up Timothy to be a bishop, taught him the doctrines, taught him everything. And Timothy now is going to be the bishop of this church. And he's saying, you're just because you're young, don't let anybody run, run you or rule you because of that. Let no man despise thy youth. If you will be an example of the believers, they'll follow you. The right ones will. And he said, be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I, give, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Three primary functions of the bishop, the, the head bishop of a church, is that he is, he is to study the word of God. He is to work on exhortation of the people and doctrine. He's to give himself to doctrine. Know the doctrines of the Bible. Know what you believe in. Know what the Bible says. And then he says in verse 14, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Now, does that mean that we should be Presbyterians? No. Presbytery means the elders, the, and it's the elder men. So, 
Brother Sterling, Brother Joe, these elder men that they're on our board of trustees. Sterling is a deacon. And this church and I rely on them to help steer and guide this vessel. Okay? And it's not just a one-man show. It's not me just saying this is how we're going to do it. The presbytery were the elder men of the church who, as Timothy is going to be ordained to be a bishop, then I'm not sure what Paul's process was, but let me tell you about mine. And I believe in this. Um, when, when we were part of a denomination, this is how they did it. But with us not being in a denomination, we still do it this way. If someone says, I think God's called me to be a preacher, or God's called me to be a deacon, or I think God's called me to be this or be that. Bible says, make your calling and election sure. Okay, that was the advice given to me by Pastor Goff when I came to this altar and I said, I think God's called me to preach. And he counseled with me after the service and he said, Mike, remember God called Samuel four times. And he said, I, he said, I'd rather God call me four times and then know that God called me than think he called me and get into it and find out God didn't call me because it's a big mistake. And it's very wise in that. But then I had to go through a process. I had to learn our doctrine. And I studied the, the doctrinal manual that we had. I studied that thing. I had it practically memorized. And then they set me aside for six months. The denomination did. I was presented to the denomination for a certificate or a license to preach. It was an ordination. It was just, I was certified to be able to preach in any of the Free Will Baptist churches. But they set me aside for six months to make sure that calling was sure. Then they examined me, a board examined me, and asked me the questions that, about what we believe. Do you, Mike, do you believe this? Mike, do you believe that? I remember being on one of those boards, on the executive board, one of the last quarterly meetings we ever went to, Sterling. And, and a church had brought in a youth pastor, and he preached out of NIV. And so the question that I asked him was, do you believe and will you preach every word of God? And he looked at me and said, absolutely. And I'm thinking in my mind, but you don't have every word of God. So I didn't, st I didn't pick a fight. We just left. We just, we just got out of the denomination because I thought that guy is not going to preach in our church when it's our time to have the meetings here. He's not preaching here. No way, no how. He was a rebel. Anyway, um, but there was a process of approval by the elders of the churches. And when they believed, when those men, it's like with the deacons. When the deacons were chosen, they set seven men aside. They prayed and fasted. They laid hands on them and ordained them to be deacons. These, this, Stephen didn't just say, I think I are to be a deacon. It, it's not done that way. And yet... A lot of like non-denominational, especially charismatic churches are done that way. Joyce Meyer's so-called calling to the ministry and salvation, according to her, was she didn't go to the altar and ask God to save her. She was driving in her car and saw a vision of Jesus and she's lost at that time and he calls her to the ministry. That doesn't sound anything like the way I was saved. Nothing like it. And she's still, if you ask my opinion, she's still operating in witchcraft. She is Jezebel. Self-appointed. Self-called. That's the first big problem. So Paul said to Timothy, uh, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy. In other words, Timothy heard... The preaching of God's word was, and from a, we know from a child, Timothy knew the Holy Scriptures. 
And so the prophecy of the word of God is what led to the calling of Timothy. But then the approval of the presbytery laying on of hands, giving him the gift, the responsibility and the stewardship of being their bishop. So who anointed and who appointed Jezebel? Nobody. Jesus said she calls herself a prophetess. And no one appointed her, anointed her, laid hands on her, nothing. She just started taking over. I have a pastor friend that last time I was at his church, he called me aside. And uh, he said, I got a problem with a guy. He said, he just showed up here. He said he had been to several churches. He shows up here and he is constantly wanting me to turn him loose with a Bible study. And he said, I don't trust the guy. The people in the church don't trust him. He's all the time sitting in Sunday school trying to correct the Sunday school teacher. And he said, I don't know how to. And he said, he don't believe the King James. And he says, there's errors in it. And I gave him some things that God had shown me and he liked that. And he said, I'm going to, I don't know what happened to the guy, but I told that pastor, I said, you know, as bad as I hate to say this, the sooner you get this guy out, the better off you're going to be because he's going to cause division. He's going to cause problems. And more than likely, he's going to, he's going to go after who do the wolves go after the weak, the weak, those who are not able to. To defend I watch lion videos Sterling and I we'd sit in the office and watch these lions face off with these great big musk oxes over there in Africa and the lion's job was to get the calves separated from the herd because lions can get killed by them horns on them oxes they can, uh, they can get killed easily with those horns and they know it and so they're not going to attack a herd of ox with their horns sticking out. They're not going to go after that herd. They're going to try to get the weakest one separated. That's going to be the supper. And that's how false prophets, false teachers, false believers in a church will work. We had a situation here years ago where a guy and his wife came and um, I won't tell you the whole story. But he was a really good musician. He played, I mean, he played the organ like, I've never seen anybody play the organ that well. I mean, he just went all over it. And he said something to me about starting a praise band. And I said, well, I said, let me, let me think about that and pray about it. Three weeks later, I get a phone call from somebody in this church saying, um, Pastor, I think I need to tell you this. I'm leaving this guy's house and he's got several people in the church practicing for a praise band. And I said, do what? She said, you didn't know about it? I said, no, I didn't know about it. She said, I didn't feel right about it. There was something in me that just didn't feel right about it. And she said, I felt like I needed to call you and ask you if you knew about this. And I said, no, but I appreciate your call. You know what? He didn't show up the next Sunday or any Sunday thereafter. I never had a, I never had a work, never had a conversation with him. He never called me and asked. I never wrote him, called him, nothing. He just boom. As soon as he was found out, he quit. Okay. I'm telling you, that's how it starts. That's how Jezebel, and we're going to study Jezebel for a little bit. That's her modus operandi. That's her script. That's how she does things. Now sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach, seduce my servants, to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Okay, problem number one. Let's turn to 1 Kings 16. Let's look at Jezebel, the real Jezebel, whom she was named after. 1 Kings 16. Turn there. I don't know if somebody was trying to get my attention about something. First Kings 16, verse 30. This is the introduction of Jezebel. She's going to equal 
Remember, everybody plays a type in the Bible. When you have a woman, you have a picture of a type of a church. And she's either going to be a, a pure church or a harlot church. A church that goes after other gods. And trust me, they're everywhere. 1 Kings 16.30 And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat. That he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Eth. Baal, Eth Baal, king of the Zidodians. Now, anytime you have Baal or Bel in a name, it's Baal. Okay? Um, Jeremiah 50 talks about Bel, B E L. That's Baal. That's the Babylonian form of the word Baal. Baal is the Antichrist, he is the devil, he is. Um, the spirit of Antichrist. And so Ahab married the daughter of the Antichrist, basically. That's who he married. Took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went, and lo and behold, who's he serving now? Baal. Baal. How did that happen? He married her. He married the spirit of Baal. Because that's who she had in her. And went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Ahab was at the top of God's evil list. And when you look, if you do a study of do a study of Ahab, even though Ahab does more evil than all of the kings before him put together, you can kind of see that Ahab has somewhat of a conscience. Because when he wants the vineyard of Naboth, he doesn't just take it. He asks. Naboth, can I have your vineyard? I'll give you a better vineyard or I'll give you the worth in money. And when Naboth said, God forbid it, I cannot sell you my vineyard. I, must, I, got, I received it from my forefathers. I have to hand it down to my firstborn son. So I'm sorry, but you can't have my vineyard. Ahad didn't just kill him and take it. He went and laid down in bed and boohooed like a little baby, cried. And was going to let that go until... Jezebel showed up. Aren't you the king? Why are you going to cry like a baby? Aren't you the king? You want the, you want the vineyard? I'll get it for you. See, that's her role. Devil hates this church. He hates what we do. He hates who we serve. He hates what we believe. And we're always going to be a target. Always. This is, at times I will say, you people need to quit coming here because you're going to be a target. As long as I'm a target, you're a target. And that bothers me. I see the devil going after my family. That bothers me. I see the devil going after people in my church. It bothers me. And I almost sometimes want to run everybody off so you don't get bothered anymore. That's just sometimes how I feel. I don't really want you to run off. But I want the devil to leave you alone. And so that's Jezebel. Ahab at least had, I think, somewhat of a conscience. But every time he did, Jezebel flew into a rage. Look in uh, 1 Kings 18. First Kings 18, eight, verse 3. Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. The governor means he was like the chief steward of Ahab's house. And Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord. That Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. 
Now again, look at this. Remember what I just said about Ahab. I think Ahab, even though he's done all this evil, he's got a wife that won't let him be right with God ever. And he's got Obadiah, his chief steward, the top man in Ahab's house, who fears the Lord and probably can like say things to Ahab that nobody else can say. And Jezebel then starts finding all the prophets of the Lord. What does it mean she cut them off? She killed every one of them. Now, this right here is what that means. Here's the prophets of the Lord right here. So what does Jezebel do in a church where they believe the Bible? Her job is to cut this out from that church and separate that church from the prophets of the Lord. That's what she does. And so what does Obadiah do? He hides them. What did David say? Thy word have I hid in my heart. Okay? That means Jezebel can't find it there and she can't kill it off. If you hide it in your heart and keep it there, then you've got protection from Jezebel and her kind. Somebody say amen. Because I'm telling you, Jezebels will come in every church looking for people that she can separate. That's what that guy was doing in that church. He'd already taught. I've had them here. People would tell me, yeah, we've been to, we've been to like six or seven different churches. Whenever somebody tells me that, it's like a guy that says, you know, I've been married five times. You tell me that, you can't convince me that you just picked the wrong woman five times. You can't convince me of that one. Okay? What happened was, five women figured you out quick and got rid of you. And when you tell me you've been in five or six different churches, then they start saying, you know... Brother Mike, at these other churches, we used to do things like this. Then go back over there and do that. Okay? I'm just telling you, that's how they work. She cuts off the prophets of the Lord. She's the one, her spirit, Babylon, is the one responsible for removing all these words and all these verses out of the modern translations. Replacing the Greek text with corrupted Greek text. That's her. But she's still got some Obadiahs around that'll hide it to where she can't kill it all off. Amen? Uh, 1 Kings 18, 19. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel into Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal 450 and the prophets of the groves 400 which eat at Jezebel's table. And let me tell you, here's what I get out of this. Jezebel takes very good care of her preachers. She pays them well. She feeds them. They eat from her table, which means basically they're her boys. And I imagine Jezebel probably wasn't a very chaste wife. She probably knew a lot of these guys. Okay? But they all ate at her table. And I've, I'm t I've been in the ministry and I've been tempted to sit at Jezebel's table and be in the ministry for the money. I wanted to climb the denominational ladder. I wanted their approval. I wanted all of that. And God beat me severely over that. But I, I know preachers. I almost. I, I went to I went to Bible college with a guy who had his career all laid out. He was going to get in the ministry, he was going to pastor this, and then he was going to move up, and he was going to write books and get published and have his name out there, and blah, 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 blah. That's what he told me he was going to do. I don't know where the guy is now, but that's what he told me. 
And I'm telling you, there are guys in the ministry and women. It's all about the money. It's all about the name. It's all about their popularity. It's all about getting their cube sold. You know what I'm talking about? The Joel Osteen inspiration cube. That's all about Joel Osteen. There's nothing in there about Jesus, nothing about salvation, nothing about warning about hell, because he doesn't even use the word in his sermons. So anyway, that's Jezebel and her exploits. You're getting a, 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 a glimpse. When Jesus called this woman Jezebel, that's what he was referring to. She's that type of woman. And Jesus was warning this church at Thyatira, you get her out or you won't have a church in a year's time. Get her out. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. Father, I've dealt with Jezebel multiple times. Been like Elijah after winning the victory. Running off and saying, Lord, it is enough. Take away my life. I hate dealing with her. I hate standing up against her. Because there's always victims. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would bless this church. Keep us, Father, keep us Jezebel free. Keep each one of us, Father, each one of us, Jezebel free. So that we don't have to take the warning from you that you gave to this church at Thyatira. Help us, dear God, to walk circumspectly. Looking around us, seeing where all the danger is, seeing where the trouble is, seeing where the devil is.